We want to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. We want to say a very special welcome to Pierre Foy from Frisco ISD, James Bowie from Dallas ISD, Marcellus from Dallas ISD, and Withers from Dallas ISD. Thank you for being with us today. Teachers, if you're watching and you have not registered, please do so. Go to www.towny.cc slash EEC register, sign up. This is just for our attendance record only. Today's program will be life cycles. During this virtual field trip, students will investigate and compare uh, how animals and plants undergo a series of orderly changes in their diverse life cycles. Ms. Fuller will talk about the life cycle of a plant. Ms. Ramirez, the life cycle of a darkling beetle. Ms. Nash, the life cycle of a butterfly. And Mr. Monroe will tell you about the life cycle of a quail. You cannot ask us verbal questions, but you can go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC space question space answer. Fill out a question, send it in. We'll try our best to answer them during the program. If not, I'll send the answer to your teacher and they can discuss it with you. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Miss, uh, Mr. Monroe is going to tell you about the life cycle of a quail. Good morning. I'm not Mr. Monroe. I'm Ms. Uh, Fuller, and I'm going to talk about the life cycle of plants. So I'm going to start off with this guy. You, does that look uh, familiar to you? Do you know what that is? Well, maybe if I showed you the inside, you would know what it is. This is a pecan. And the pecan, it, the pecan tree is the um, state tree of Texas. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the pecan tree in a few minutes. But I just want you to know that those great big trees come from this little seed called a pecan. Now, the first thing we're going to look at when we start the slide presentation are conifers. And those are cone bearing plants. And uh, this, they can come, the cones can come small, actually even smaller than this, and kind of medium size, and even these big giant cones. But the seed inside the cones are tiny. They're very small and they have a little papery wing with them. So let me go ahead and share my screen with you. And here we go. So the life cycle of plants, size, color, flowers, and fruits can make a difference. Now, these are conifers that you're seeing on this screen right here. You see the pine cone over on the left in the, uh, in the second picture, you'll see a little tree that's just beginning in life. And over on the right-hand side, you'll see giant trees that are uh, toward the mature part of their lives. So, uh, plants have life cycles just like animals do. Okay, now I'm going to show you some pictures that I took a few minutes ago in our garden. These are tomato plants in our garden. When you come out here to visit us next year on a field trip, you can come and look at our garden. And uh, you see those These are little our tomato oops. plants. Can you see the little yellow flower? That's where the tomato is going to form where the little flower is. Here are some bell pepper plants. Now we're gonna go over here. I'll let you look at our cattle real quick. And there's a cow, well, look, there's some cattle egrets out there. All right, and now we're in the, the bed that has, this is a watermelon plant right here. And there's some okra. And we're gonna come down here and see some more okra plants. And here's some dill. And there's another tomato plant that's turning yellow because of too much water. And so all of these started from seeds except this little turnip. Can you see him? And he got started from a turnip that started sprouting. Okay, bye-bye. All right, so you saw our little garden there and the different things that we have growing in our little garden. So let me escape that and get into some, some essential questions that we have. As you're watching the program, these are uh, some questions you need to keep in mind. Number one, how can plants get started in life? 
Most of the plants I just showed you in our raised bed garden started from seed, but one, that little turnip plant, actually started from the top of a turnip that was cut off and it started sprouting. So I stuck it in the ground and we're gonna see if we get some seeds off of that in a few weeks. Now, number two, what do we call the plant after the seed germinates and it lifts up from the soil? Now down here we have a succulent and succulents, you can start them differently than you do a uh, plant from a seed. But look at that enormous pecan tree. That enormous pecan tree came from a pecan like the one I just showed you a few minutes ago. So what are seeds? The new plant begins in a seed. When the seed germinates, the tiny stem raises up toward the sun so it can carry off photosynthesis. And the tiny root goes down toward the center of the earth because of gravity. And that tiny root uh, is what enables water to get into the, the plant, but it's also what anchors the plant in the soil. Now over on the left is a big giant seed that you are probably very familiar with. That's a coconut. And that's what the seed to the coconut palm is. And you can see them growing. On the right hand side, you see sunflower seeds. And if you like to watch baseball, you know that baseball players love to eat uh, sunflower seeds, as do lots of birds. Now here's some okra plants. Uh, when, when the okra seedling, when it germinate, the seed germinates and starts to rise up, the seedling starts forming leaves to carry out photosynthesis. And then the stalk begins to grow, the big stem. It forms this beautiful mallow flower called an okra flower or mallow flower. And when that fades, there's the okra. That's the fruit of the okra plant. And guess what's inside the okra pods? Seeds, okra seeds. Now here's our lovely pecan that we started the lesson with. This is what they look like growing on the tree. They have a green husk around them and they grow in the tree like this. Now, in the fall, in October or November, the husk will turn brown and open up and the pecans will fall out. Don't try to pick it out of the husk because it will dye your fingers. It won't, it'll make your fingers look very dirty, but it will actually dye your fingers. You can't wash it off and you'll have to wait for it to wear off. Okay, now here's tomato plant. We've got tomatoes out there in our garden. Do you see all these little seeds right here growing inside the tomato plant? You can plant those and get your own tomato plant. And the, the, the fruit of the tomato plant, the tomato is actually a fruit. Grass, grasses are fascinating. And we get lots of grains from grasses like rice and corn and wheat. And this particular one right here is sorghum. And when all these start, they just look like blades of grass uh, after they germinate. And th these are the seed heads on them right there. And when fall comes and the, the grass dies, these seed heads fall to the ground and start the process all over again. Now, these are the succulents that I showed you at the beginning. These start a little bit different than the other ones that I've shown you. You can pull one of these off and stick it in the pot and it will begin, begin to grow roots. So you don't have to have a seed for this particular plant to grow. Now let's look at, talk about an activity at home. Find a plant at home, at school, even at the park. What color is it? I bet it will be green. How tall is it? Draw a picture of the plant and color it and show it to your teacher. This is a good time to discuss what the plant may have looked like when it was a baby. Make sure whatever you do with these activities that you have an adult with you. So I'm gonna escape from this and stop my share. And if you have any questions about the life cycle of the plant, how it goes from seed to seedling, to a young plant, to a flower, to a fruit, and then a mature plant, you can ask Dr. Gorman. He'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you. So sorry, Ms. Fuller. I grabbed the life cycle for the first grade instead of the third grade, but I think we have it straight now. Uh, we do have a question. How big is a redwood tree seed and a redwood tree? Redwood cones are about an inch long and the seeds are very small about the size of the tomato seed 
that Miss Fuller just showed you. And it, how big does that tree grow from that small seed? Average 200 to 240 feet tall, where some individuals have actually reached 350 feet tall. That's taller than a football field is long, guys. That is one big tree to come from that very small seed. Now, Miss Ramirez is going to tell you about the life cycle of the darkling beetle. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're going to be learning about the life cycle of a darkling beetle. So to begin, I'm going to share my iPad screen with you guys so that we can take a trip over to our beetle habitat so you can see some examples of how the beetle changes as it grows. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys. It might take just a second to link the iPad uh, to the Zoom. So while I'm getting the link together, be thinking about uh, what do you think? think the darkling beetle looks like and how do you think it changes as it grows? So I think I have my um, iPad set to go. So let me get the video going. So here is our darkling beetle habitat. And the first thing we're going to take a look at are these guys right here. So these are the adult darkling beetles. So notice the color. What do they look like? Also think about how are they behaving? So how are they moving and what are they doing? Now, these are the adults and the adults have an important job to do because they actually will reproduce and they lay the eggs. Um, so here we have the adult beetle. The eggs are super tiny, so we're really not gonna be able to see them. Um, but out of the egg, we'll have what's called the larva. And you can actually see an example of a larva right here. Now this is a big larva. So as the larva is growing, it actually sheds or loses its skin, sort of like how a snake does. And every time it loses its skin, it will grow bigger and bigger. Now let's see if we can find some other larva. Oh, there's another one. Now they're all in the potato because the potato has water or moisture in it and that is how they drink. So let's see if we can find, oh, here's a lot of larva in this potato. So notice the size of those larvae. Again, the larvae come in all sizes. So the super small larva, that means they were probably uh, pretty young compared to the bigger size larva that has already had time to grow and get bigger. And then once the larva gets rather big, so this is about the typical size of the larva, once it gets to that size, um, it's gonna start to slow down in its movement. It's gonna curl into a little ball called a pupa. And here we have the pupa. Now notice the color and the movement of the pupa. They really don't move and they're not really that fascinating to look at. Uh, the pupa is what we call the resting stage. So they might not be doing much, but inside that pupa, the organism is actually changing and it's preparing itself to turn or metamorph into the adult beetle. So first we have the egg, then we have the larva, then we have the pupa, and then we have the adult. And it's important to learn about these stages because animals depend on these organisms for food. So I have an animal friend he was camera shy during the morning session. So we'll see if he wants to eat for you guys. This is Spike and he's a bearded dragon. He will normally, he loves these as treats, but I think because he's on camera, he's like, I don't know about this. Uh, but he normally loves to eat these mealworms. We'll see. There's actually a pupa in there. I will tell you this morning, all of these were still in the larval phase. So at some point, between this morning and now, that one turned into a pupa. And when they just turn into a pupa, they are very white or pale in color. And there's Spike. He's kind of looking at him, but I don't know if he's going to go for it. So we'll see. Maybe, oh, there he did. He went for it. Uh, so there is Spike, the bearded dragon, eating the mealworms. We also call mealworms larva. So y'all got a treat because he didn't want to eat in the morning section. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop our screen share and we're gonna look at some other stuff on a PowerPoint. So let me stop that and let me put Spike up before he runs away. And I'm gonna share my computer screen this time. So let me get that screen going. And the next thing that we're gonna take a look at are a couple of essential questions. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, 
you'll be able to answer these two questions. The first is what do we call the type of metamorphosis that darkling beetles go through? And the second is you should be able to um, explain if a mealworm is an insect or a worm. So keep those two questions in mind. And of course, we know that it's important to learn about mealworms uh, because other animals use them for food. So here we have a spider that grabbed a mealworm to eat. We have chickens eating mealworms and people actually eat mealworms too for food as well. So in our next slide, uh, this is an example of the metamorphosis or those life cycle changes that the beetle goes through. And beetles go through what's called complete metamorphosis. And again, metamorphosis is just a change. Now, this is considered complete metamorphosis because it has four stages. Uh, this beetle starts out as an egg. Out of the egg hatches the larva. The larva is gonna be super tiny when it hatches out of that egg. And as it grows, it's gonna get bigger and bigger. And it gets bigger because it's able to shed its skin. And we call that skin its exoskeleton. So you can see in this picture, this larva has shed its old skin or exoskeleton, and it's gonna grow a little bit bigger each time it sheds that skin or exoskeleton. Eventually, once that larva gets all the food and nutrients that it needs, its body is going to start to slow down and it's going to curl into what looks like a little ball and we call that the pupa. Now remember the pupa doesn't really move a lot. Um, it's sort of like the resting stage where its body is preparing itself to metamorph or change into the adult. And then of course we saw from our little video that the adult is super active, crawling around, looking for food, uh, resources, and a mate. And it will be the female uh, that will eventually lay those eggs and then the whole cycle will start over again with a new generation of beetles. So let's take a look at a quick little video of a mealworm turning into a pupa. Now this is time-lapsed. Uh, it actually takes a little bit longer than what you're seeing in the video. But as the mealworm or larva is getting ready to turn into a pupa, it starts to slow down. It doesn't really move as much as it used to. It will eventually shed its last exoskeleton from the larva stage. So you can see it's pushing off that old skin. And underneath we have the pupa starting to emerge. And if you look really carefully at that pupa, you might be able to see some features that might show up in the adult. So you might be able to make up what would be the eyes later on, what will be the legs later on. And notice these organisms are insects. And we know that they're an insect because they have six legs. And when they're an adult, you'll be able to see their defined antenna. So there's our pupa. And notice when it first turns into a pupa, it is really white in color, it's really pale. And once it spends a few days in that pupa stage, it will start to get darker. So I'm gonna move us to the next video so we can see the next stage. The next stage will be the pupa to the actual adult. And again, it's also time-lapse super fast. Uh, so when it's getting ready to turn into the adult, the pupa will be really dark and you'll be able to make out what will turn into the legs and the antenna. So it almost looks like the adult, it's just not quite there yet. And you can see it starts to move more. It becomes a little more active. Eventually, it's going to start to push away that old pupa exoskeleton and then out will emerge or come out the adult beetle. And when that adult finally emerges, it's also going to be kind of white or pale in color. And then in a few days, it'll start to get that color back. Uh, so you saw in my box, the adults were kind of brown or black. So eventually in a few days, those newly hatched adults uh, will get their color. And then in our next slide, I have a challenge for you guys. It's a beetle scavenger hunt. So go outside and find an adult beetle, a larva, or even a pupa. And with the help of an adult, take a picture of it or draw and color it. Also see if you can try and identify what type of beetle it is. Now you guys are familiar with beetles. Ladybugs are a beetle. 
June bugs are a beetle. We see those big brown beetles, the June bugs during the summertime. Also lightning bugs, those are also beetles too. So go outside and see what you can find and see if you can find examples of those different life stages. So I'm going to stop my screen share and I have one last thing I wanna show you guys. So remember I told you that the uh, mealworms are part of a food chain. Animals like to eat them like our beater dragon, but also people will eat them too. And I came across these cool little things. They're called larvette. And um, it is larva or the mealworm. Again, larva and mealworm are the same thing. Um, they are fit for human consumption. So these mealworms have been air fried and uh, they actually sell them in the stores. This one is cheddar cheese flavor. I don't really like that one, uh, but this one was Mexican spice and they actually taste um, kind of like a Frito. So those uh, chips that you guys might eat. And so here's a few of them. They are rather crispy and crunchy like a chip. Um, to me, they, kind, they don't taste that bad. Um, so next time you're out and around and you come across any of these at the store, you might wanna give them a try. Um, and that's all I have for you guys today for mealworms. We're gonna give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Ms. Ramirez, I wonder how many of our students are gonna actually try to eat a mealworm and see if they taste like a Frito or a chip. Uh, I think I'll let them do it and then they can tell me. We have a question. Do darkened beetles bite or harm humans? These beetles are harmless to humans. They don't bite or spread disease, uh, but they will, they will bite you if you bother them a great deal, but it really won't hurt you. Okay, now we're going to uh, let Miss Nash talk to us about butterflies. Hello, welcome to my classroom. Today we're talking about the life cycle of the butter everyone's favorite insect. So beautiful. You can see them fluttering around in the, in the garden, looking for nectar from the flowers. And if you're lucky, you can find some butterfly larva, the caterpillar. So we're gonna look at a few pictures and then some other things I have here to show you. Let's look at some, how that life cycle goes. So we're all familiar with the life cycle of the butterfly. And of course, it starts in the adult butterfly. The food, the, they lay an egg, and they usually choose a special plant. This is really important. They choose the plant they lay their egg on very, very carefully. Usually only one kind or one family of plants. They lay the egg, a tiny, tiny egg. And then out of that egg comes a tiny, tiny caterpillar which eats and eats and eats and eats and grows bigger and bigger. And finally, when it's grown big enough, it will become a pupa, it will pupate, it will stop growing and it will pupate. And inside the pupa, they change into the butterfly. And they come on out, here, they hang themselves upside down, change into the pupa case, and then gradually change inside and then come out, pump their wings up, and fly away. So we're all familiar with that monarch. Egg, larva, pupa, adult. And notice the color. So this really bright, stripy yellow and black color of the larva and the orange and black of the adult. Tell birds, don't eat me, you'll be sorry because the plant that they eat is toxic, not to them, but to, to the birds that they eat the caterpillar or the adult. Pretty amazing. So here are a few of the common local butterflies that you might see around in the garden, at the park, in the schoolyard, the hackberry butterfly. And as you might imagine from the name, they eat the larva, eat hackberry leaves and eggs here and here's the caterpillar. And notice that this one doesn't have those warning colors like the monarch did. It's green to hide and camouflage because that one doesn't taste bad. And the hackberry leaf is not toxic. And we know this because if you have a dog or a horse or a goat around, 
you will, and they, ha they have a hack root tree handy. They will eat all the leaves that they can reach. They must be really yummy. And here's the adult butterfly. Here's another one of my favorites. It's called the giant swallowtail. It's our biggest butterfly that we have around here. It's black with these yellow stripes going across like this. There's another yellow and black one, but the stripes go up and down. That's the tiger swallowtail. So the swallowtail has these long tails on the hind wing, okay, like a swallow, a kind of bird. But the interesting thing about these is they lay their eggs on one kind of one family of trees, citrus. And we have a native around here called the toothache tree or the Hercules club, the prickly ash. And the caterpillars, when they're little, they look like a bird dropping. So nobody wants to eat a bird dropping. If they grow bigger, they kind of change color and they become more camouflaged to look like part of the stem. And finally, here's that chrysalis, that pupa case. And look how little string they hung up. Really beautiful, very well camouflaged, looking just like that, that bark, right? And then here's the adult. Another common one around is the pipe vine swallowtail. Again, a swallowtail with those tails on that hind wing. Beautiful blue, orange underneath when they close their wings. It's again a warning. Here's the caterpillar. And those orange dots are a warning. Okay. Here's the pupa case because these leaves also have a toxin in them. So it protects the butterfly. Here the butterfly is drinking nectar. Okay. And they all butterflies don't eat. They only drink nectar. And while they're getting that nectar, they get the pollen from the flower stuck on their body and they go to another flower and they help the flower make seeds. So the flower, the plant can make more plants. So the plant gets pollinated and the butterfly gets food. So it's kind of a win-win for everyone. So here's the, a funny one, look at this one, the, a snout butterfly has a funny snout, okay. These are the tiger swallowtails here with the tiger stripes going up and down. The red admiral, they're really common. And then the painted lady. Here's some common plants that we have to feed those very butterflies we looked at. The um, milkweed, we have two kinds here, the green milkweed and the antelope horns. Here's that pipe vine. Here's the weird flower. It looks like a pipe, that's why they call them pipe vines. And here's the hackberry tree. You might have these trees around. They're really common and people don't like them, but really, they're really interesting for the animals. And here's, I have that weird bark. So you can find those around and look for the butterflies. And here's that toothache tree. Okay, just look at this bark. Wow, it's got all those thorns on it. Okay, so now let's look at a few more things here in the classroom. So butter caterpillars, since they can't run away, have to protect themselves with those weird colors, or maybe some big scary eyes. Those aren't really eyes, they're just spots that look like giant eyes on this big moth caterpillar. Cool. Another way to protect yourself is to look like something that doesn't taste good. So it's a monarch, it doesn't taste good to birds, but this one probably tastes kind of good, but because it looks like the monarch, the birds don't eat it. It's called mimicry. Isn't that amazing? And here's one of my favorite examples of camouflage. So we have a, a similar species out in our close up preserve called the goat wing, but this one, when the wings are open, they're bright orange and black, but then when they close their wings, look what they look like. They look just like, that's a butterfly. It looks just like a dead leaf. You even have the veins of the leaves. Isn't that amazing? So amazing. And here's an adult moth with scary eyes <laughs> to scare animals away. Here's one that looks like a bumblebee, even though it's not. So you can look around for leaves that the caterpillars have been eating, okay? I found these that I couldn't find any caterpillars, but they're out there. Probably a little moss, I think. And I had some butterfly larvae, and I told them on Friday, I'll be back on Monday.
eat up and I gave them a lot of food and I think they ate all that food and then they had enough. And so, so they, they have turned into a chrysalis. See all those little chrysalis hanging on the top of that little container here. So they're not doing anything much now, but changing inside, they're starting to change into butterflies. And so in a few more days, they're changing butterflies and then I can let them go in the garden so they can go find some nectar. So lots of fun things to learn about butterflies and moths. Okay? And you can go outside to the garden, you can observe them. Please don't catch them because they, their wings have scales on them and it damages them. If you touch them, they can get hurt. So just look at them and watch what they're doing. Are they nectar? Are they getting nectar? Remember, they don't eat, they just drink. Are they laying eggs? Can you find any caterpillars? So lots of fun things to observe in the gardens and the parks around town. If you have any questions, Dr. Gorman would be glad to answer. Thank you, Ms. Nash. And we did have a question. What is the largest butterfly in the world? Uh, the Queen Alexandra butter Birdwing. The Queen Alexander Birdwing is the largest living butterfly with a wingspan that stretches almost a foot across. That's 12 inches, guys. One of the rarest butterflies in the world. It's found only in the rainforest of Papua New Guinea. Thank you again, Miss Nash. And now Mr. Monroe is gonna to talk to you about quail. Hello, everyone. My name is Mr. Monroe, and we're going to be investigating the life cycle that exists with quail. Now, the particular uh, species of quail that I'm going to be introducing to you today, it's really funny how some people that raise these quail, they describe each life cycle change that this little quail goes through. You can almost compare it to the names that are given to the stages in the life cycle of humans. So, to get started, I'm going to share my screen with you and hopefully I can show you the short video. So bear with me while I do this. And let's see what's happening with these little guys. Look like baby chickens, don't you? Ooh, now that was kind of aggressive. These guys are really, really tiny. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and let's talk about these guys. Well, what you were observing are two little baby cartonic, Coturnix quail. And Coturnix quail are really popular today. Now, growing up where I grew up, in Northwestern Oklahoma, I had no idea that there were so many different species or so many different kinds of quail in the world today. The only species or kind of quail I was familiar with was the Bob White quail, which is very common right here in the state of Texas. In the state of Texas, you might even find another species called the blue quail or the payroll quail. But the Coturnix quail basically are found indigenous to the continent of Asia or in the country of Asia. Now, a lot of people are primarily raising this quail simply because they are very fast growing through their life stages. And I've got a couple of things I want you to think about while we go through this program. Uh, your teacher might ask you a question in the future about some of the things that I might have stated or showed you. Uh, they may even ask you, what do we call baby quail? Or they might even ask you, why does a baby quail resemble, resemble or look like the parent quail? Well, as we go through the presentation, I will give you those answers, all right? And I will share the first one with you because, you know, what do we call baby quail? Well, the quail that you saw in the video, they are referred to as button quail. Now, that name, 
kind of could be the um, kind of could be like a riddle because you you know you you hear this little phrase that says as cute as a button and those guys were really cute weren't they now students listen there are different stages in the life cycle that you just observed in fact they all started from hatching from an egg just like this now it takes 17 days for a Caternix quail to hatch from an egg. And one of those little fellas that you were observing actually hatched from this egg. And it must've been quite a job because that little quail had to chip away and free itself from this egg without any help. And this egg shell is pretty thick. So he was really, really working. Now, they are referred to as button quail in the first 10 days, baby quail. Up to day 10, they are button quail. Once they leave day 10 and they enter the next period, which is 11 days to 21 days, they're then referred to as a toddler. Now we know that that name is used with humans. And usually with humans, a toddler would be a little one that's somewhere around two years old. But with the quail, it's 11 days to 21 days. At the 22nd day, they become what they uh, are referred to as a teenager. Now, they will stay that teenager level or that, that particular stage until they reach the 56th day. Once they reach the 56th day, then they will become a young adult. And usually around that 56 or that 57th day, you might even notice that the females will start laying eggs. And at that time, their diet really has to change. They'll have to have a little bit of calcium in their uh, whatever they're eating because that's what the eggshell basically is made out of. So if they start laying eggs, they're going to need a little bit of calcium. And you know, quail can live uh, up to two years normally. And usually in the period from one year to two years, that's what we call the golden age. In the golden age, I guess in human years, it would be like a senior citizen, okay? Now, the quail have a tendency to look like either their parents or their grandparents through something that we call heredity. Uh, looking at myself, and I should have brought a picture of my dad, I kind of favor my dad a little bit, even in my body size, and that is through heredity, okay? Now, the colors of Caternix quail can be very mixed. They can be very dark brown, kind of with a scale pattern, or they can be caramel, or they can be mottled brown, and even some of them are white. Now, the females, the ones that lay the eggs, Usually they're a little bit larger than the male. And just like I said before, from the button quail, to the toddler, to the teenager, to the young adult, to the adult and the golden years, those are the life stages in the life cycle of a quail. And basically most quail will go through that, even the bob whites, the pharaohs, and the, the blue quail. Now, I do have a few of the Caternix quail that are at their different stages in their life cycle. I'm going to get out, starting with the youngest, and hopefully I can catch one of them. They're in this box over here to my right. You know, these little guys, right after they come out of that shell and they're wet, and then that wetness kind of dries out, they're already moving around better than two-week-old uh, two chickens. So they get pretty active real quick, guys. All right, let me see if I can catch one here. These guys are already trying to fly at this very young age. Now, this is a toddler. This one just turned a toddler. And you can see it does have a yellowish color. Whoa, come back, come back, trying to fly. And we see a little bit of white in its wings 
So I'm wondering as this one goes through its life stages, whether this one may end up being one of those rare white ones. I can hear its partner calling, calling. it's missing this one. They do communicate, guys. All right, now the next one I wanna show you, and I have to be careful getting this one out because this one can fly. And if it flies away, it's not gonna come back. Peek in here and see if I can grab it. Come here, youngin. Oh, I got you. Hedge. There we go. Now this one is a little bit older and you can see this is a female. Now, one way to tell the female, they say if you look at the breast and I can't really tell on this one, you should see spots. That's one way to tell the female. But this is a little older. I would say this one is approaching young adulthood, okay? That's a Caternix quail. A little bit older than the one I showed you previously. Now the real trick is I'm going to get an adult out. And this adult, pretty tricky in getting out. If it flies away, I definitely gonna lose it. Whoa, there she is. And this is a female. Whoop, whoop, whoop. I got you. This is a female. We see the spots. See the spots? This is a female. And this is an adult. In fact, this is the parent of one of those that you actually saw in the video. Okay. Yep, that's a female, Caternix 12. And she just lost one of her feathers. Okay, okay, girl. I'll put you back. There you go. So there you have it. The life stages of a Caternix quail. Hopefully you guys have learned a little bit about the, the quail cycle, the quail life cycle. I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gorman. So if any of you have any questions, he might be able to answer those for you. You guys have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. How interesting. A uh, question came in, how big is a full grown quail? Well, there's three to four different kinds, but we're gonna give you an average. Quail measure about 10 to 12 inches in length. They have a wingspan of 14 to 16 inches, and they weigh about five ounces to a half a pound. And now that is a mature, full grown quail that we're talking about, not the smaller ones like Mr. Monroe showed you. Okay, now I'm going to stop. I'm going to share my screen. During this virtual field trip, students investigated the paradigm animals plants undergo a series of orderly changes in their diverse life cycles. Uh, Ms. Fuller told you about the life cycle of a plant. Ms. Ramirez, the life cycle of the darkling beetle. The life cycle of the butterfly was explained by Ms. Nash. And Mr. Monroe just got through telling you about the life size of a quail. Thank you. How did we do, teachers? If you would, go to uh, www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback, fill out a short form and send it back to us. We would appreciate it. You guys have a great rest of the day, but more importantly, you have a great rest of your life. Thank you again for joining us.